Hi, book club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. This is episode number 114, and our book is Dawn of Fire, Sea of Souls by Chris Raitt. This is the, what, seventh book in the Dawn of Fire series and tells the story of one fateful journey for one fateful ship. It was not, in fact, a three-hour tour. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via Twitter, YouTube, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. Spoiler warning, if you haven't yet read the book, definitely check it out and then listen to this episode as we'll be to start discussing the book from start to finish in great detail. As usual, did you enjoy the book? I really did. I went into this with low expectations because it's Donna Fire, even though it's Chris Raitt. And then I found myself in a really, really good horror novel. That I think as a horror novel, if you ignore the epilogue, which we'll talk about here in a minute, it was a really solid horror novel. I feel comfortable saying that this is arguable. This is easily the best Donna Fire book we've read. Um, probably because it didn't really deal with Donna Fire. Until the epilogue. You know, um, I'd still say Gate of Bones is my favorite. And they're both kind of neck and neck with that because it's great till the end, right? Both books. Yeah, I actually thought about that a lot when we were reading this book. Um, I was drawing a lot of parallels at the end there, especially with the two of them. Um, but yeah, he. this was a good, solid horror novel. I actually think I would have really liked had they removed the Dawn of Fire uh, from the start and removed the epilogue. They could have just published this as a standalone Zeth book. I mean, standalone book in the Warhammer Horror series. It's been a long time since we've had a Warhammer Horror novel. And um this one definitely filled that need. Like it was a it was as fun as the half of the book that was a horror novel of Knights of McCrag. Yes. That and similar type of horror. Anything on a ship is going to automatically be pretty scary because you can't, there's nowhere to escape. And it wasn't, the Gellerfield didn't even fail. It was a whole, like, we have no idea what's going on. We know that there's some warp fuckery, but we don't know what. <laughs> like it too. I don't know why every time this gets trotted out, I really like it. When people are, there's something wrong. But I don't know what, um, especially when everyone's kind of feeling it in their own way very early on um, when Ortuyo and the navigator, Satalina, are talking, right? And they're like, something's not right here. And then Avadi and Barosia have their moment where they're like, something doesn't feel right here. Um, everybody kind of feels it in their own way. But of course, because the way that the Imperium is, nobody's going to say anything. I can't, A, I can't prove it. And I understand that. That's just any, like, major operation, right? We're not going to grind everything to a halt because someone's got a bad feeling. Um, and to be fair, in the Warhammer 40k universe, I think everybody pretty much exists having a bad feeling. Plus, if they're um, playing that drinking game, they'd just be drunk all the time. Let's be real. Let's be very real. Um, that's part of it. And then, but also, nobody wants to cross that line into heresy, right? Of... Something's wrong here. I can't put my finger on it, but something doesn't feel right mentally. Nobody wants to. <laughs> nobody wants to step up with that particular. So I will. I will. I will be the one who steps forward and says that something's not right. I get it. It's a tough ask. Well, I mean, they all gotta be tough and strong, and you know the whole idea of like if you say something's wrong, well. Is there actual heresy going on or are you the heretic or are you a coward now? Well, we don't take too kindly to cowards in the Warhammer 40k universe. The heretics and cowards pretty much get the same treatment. Yeah. So let's let's dive in because I, I want to save some of our meta commentary for the end because I know we have a lot mm -hmm. of it. <laughs> let's focus on the book for a hot minute. Um, was Kiastros, did you like him as a character? Was he a good captain overall? I mean, obviously great, up until the whole lunacy. He was a great captain. It made me very sad what happened with him. Yes. Um, I'm fascinated by the Imperial Navy in general. 
And I really like Imperial. I like space combat. I love that whole concept. I think because I know for me, it would be utterly beyond my capabilities. Um, that whole like thinking in the actual geometries and having to think in a three dimensional space. And like when they talk about and the physics um, of all of it, the physics of all of it. And like a slight turn can have catastrophic results. And that's all it really takes. And you have to think like in terms of slow, <laughs> like this, the speed and the scale of it mm -hmm. is. And I thought Chris Wright did a great job of conveying that. Oh, yeah. When they exited the warp and prepared for that ship that was coming at them, I thought that was masterfully written. It reminded me a lot of Flight of the Eisenstein, which is probably still one of my favorite books in the Horus Heresy, just because of, there you go, it's your first drink of the year, people. Um, just because of flight, the Flight of the Einstein, because it was the mixture of slight, not horror, but psychological horror that was going on and void warfare and trying to escape. So this, to me, tapped into that so very well. I thought it was so well done. One of the things, okay, so you've already taken a drink for Carrie. I will give you your second drink for the evening and the Night Lords trilogy. There's this actually really interesting scene where their captain is he's been possessed by a demon more or less and there's a scene where they have to go into void warfare and the demon lets the captain come back to the forefront of the consciousness because even the demon is like this is bonkers i need someone <laughs> who actually knows what they're doing to do this and that is that's to me i'm like that's all you really need to know about the void combat I love the description of the broadsides. I love the, the chatter, like the way that he talks and the way that Barosia just immediately like, yes, broadships, I, everybody. I love the whole, the tightness of it. And I did like, at one point, Cash just made like a little quip about how he's just like, nobody else is, you know, or he likes the Space Marines because he's like, they're the only people who are as structured as we are in the Navy. And I was like, you have to be mm -hmm. because it's so... One of my fa one of my favorite movies of all time, believe it or not, like in my top twenty, top fifteen, maybe is Master and Commander of Her Side of the World. Taps in <laughs> to some of my Master and Commander stuff. Um, absolutely loved all of that, and I thought Castros was a great character. I thought he was a good political beast. You could see how he knew when to balance before his lunacy sets in. Mm -hmm. He knew how to balance the the. Um, the personalities, let's say, of his crew, he knew when people looked off, like when Cull, when he's like, something's not right there, but I know I shouldn't pick at that. He was on good terms with his navigator. He just seemed like a good dude. Yeah, like even when his navigator was like, I don't like Avati. And he was like, why? And she would tell him, he's like, I think that's cool that she's like that. You know, he just, you know, he accepts people's personalities and understands how to how to use them, how to actually bring out their highest potential. And it didn't bother him Very that she though. wanted her own ship. He's like, that's fine. There's no reason just to hang out here until something happens with me. You know, whereas you, the, the navigator the whole time was just like, oh, she's she's out to get you. She's out to get you. And he's like, she just wants her own ship. It's fine. She's got ambition. Okay. He would rather have yeah. he'd rather have that someone who wants to prove themselves and do well every single time versus someone who's just, you know, phoning it in and is just happy where, you know, maybe not happy where they are, but is they're fine with where they are. Right. Um, if anyone's ever seen the Star Trek episode where Q lets Picard go back and fix one of his fatal mistakes, he discovers he goes through an alternate timeline where he's not a captain and he asks Captain Riker why he's not a captain and Riker's like you don't take chances you, you really have no ambition you play everything super safe um I that tapped into that I did like I agree with you completely especially when he was talking about Avadi. he's just like yeah yeah she is she's eager and you kind of got the impression that the way he talked about her like I was kind of like that too mm -hmm. and yet once um space madness starts to kick in he starts needling her about it and it starts gnawing away at the back of his head, right? Where he's like, should I even leave her up there? She's just going to try and take over my bridge. But no, 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 no. I've got something else I want to do, but she's probably going to try and stage a mutiny. Like, it makes you wonder if he was always like, no, it doesn't bother me. But secretly, somewhere in the lizard part of his brain, it definitely was a thought. 
Well, I mean, I think it's always a thought, you know, especially when he sees the madness settling into everybody on the ship. And he knows that this is if there's going to be a mutiny. This is the time that there is going to be a mutiny. And the sad thing is, in fact, she and Garak did discuss possibly if he was if he was insane. And, you know, Garak didn't want to do it. No, he confronted him. He was just like, what what have you done? Basically, like <laughs> you've made everything worse. He's like, OK, fine. You killed them all. Just get it off the ship. Like get off the ship right. and everything will be fine. And then he's he couldn't couldn't he could not let it go. Um, like the one ring of power. Yes. Now that he has it, he can use it. This is what he needs. And no, I, it's like, I you did... know, Sildor, right? When he had the ring, he didn't throw it in the fires of Mordor like he was supposed to. He was just like, nah. <laughs> it looks good. It'll be fine. It looks good on my hand though, doesn't it? Yeah. So it it's just right perfectly. Here. Um, very much so. And I thought that I did like Garrick. I like when he's talking with Avadi and he's just like, I always liked you better anyways. But then the whole time he's down there, he's like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Um, and we'll I talk just thought more he about said the... that flippantly, you know, trying to make light of a situation. Trying to be like, ah, this is fine. This is not fine. None of this is fine. Um, I really, it made me so sad to see Castros go be, from this just impeccably controlled human to... I mean, he's literally manic at the end. Well, right. When well, they talk about how he's like feverish. Mm -hmm. And they said like his teeth, he had like ground them. Like, they were cracked and gray. It's just like, oh, gosh, it's just so sad. Fucking warp, man. <laughs> so let's talk about his crew. Who amongst the crew were your favorite? Let's start with let's just go through our list here. Let's start with Margot, the navigator. Did you like her? No. No, I mean I thought she was a she was a good navigator, but I thought she was she was, she was too bitchy just to be bitchy. She was very much a product of that aristocracy and her age, right? Just oh, I know everything because I'm aristocracy. I can say these things to you. Well, you like she, like Avadi would ask her a very normal question. Like, and she would reply frostily. Yes, and just, like, you don't have to answer that way. No, you don't have to be this way. Grow up. You're what's giving women a bad name. Um, she, I liked that she was very imperious, even in the end, right? When she's just like, oh, let me show you. Let me show you what I look at. Damn, woman. Yeah. She what, never what really, a way she, to go. <laughs> she kind of cracks, but she doesn't succumb to space madness per se like she doesn't completely she doesn't have as dramatic of a corruption as the captain does let's talk about avadi speaking of not really corruption did you see avadi keeping it together like at the beginning of the book where you're like oh yeah this this woman's gonna keep it together by the end of the book uh yeah no but i'm glad she did same I kind of thought she was going to be the, I really, once the, the kind of, when they started hinting that, oh man, something's not right in the ship, I kind of thought she was going to be like, and now's my time. Right. But nope. she was very quick. Like when Barosh is like, we got to get out. There's something not right. And she grabbed him. And she's like, you need to get it together. I'm going to shoot you myself. And he was like, whoa. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Because even, then, even though she does have a, have ambition, she understands that the only way she can fulfill her ambitions is for everybody to survive. Yes. She needs every person on there. She can't do their jobs herself. I did not peg her. In fact, in the very beginning of the book, I kind of didn't like her because they kind of play her as the petty. Yeah, the petty, the firebrand, the upstart, right? The I'm the ambitious one who's going to take over for the captain. And I don't really like the captain. I was like, oh, I see where this is. Oh, no, I don't see where this is going. So I actually really liked it. She goes out like a badass. Yeah. Like, if I'm going to die, I'm taking the navigator with me. I was like, you know what? That's fair. That's absolutely fair. That's what I ended um, up having in my notes. Because I was listing all the characters. I was like, killed by this person. Killed by this person. <laughs> Erosia made me sad. I liked him from the get-go. 
and his just but i did like that he phrased but at the end there when avadi is saying to him like you have to get these people working you have crew idol and he's like they won't work i can't make them oh dear <laughs> Yeah, because even she was noticing that he had totally lost all control and everyone was just yelling at one another. Mm -hmm. He's the only one that we didn't really know what happened to him. Wait, I thought he... Oh, shoot. Now that you say that, I can't remember how he died. I don't remember him dying. I just remember last thing... I don't really... The last thing I remember was her seeing that he was had lost control over everything. But she had to go yeah. talk, talk to the navigator. And Kiastros was already gone by that point. And Garrick was already gone by that point. So, like... I think we can make some assumptions. Probably can. I, I wouldn't be surprised if his crew killed him, to be honest. And, you know, Speed... They were there. They, they lost contact with Speed, and I'm just going to assume that things went bad down below. Okay? Yeah... Um, Garrick crushed me. I liked him oh from God. the start. I liked I Garrick was... so much. I loved him my from the Zod start. crushed me. Oh my God. Even, so, even Garrick... the freaking hospitaler. Isabel, I loved her. Um, but so Garrick, I liked him from the get go. And I was really worried. I was like, ooh, once everyone started to feel a little off, I'm like, oh, man, this guy's either going to get killed by his own guys mm-hmm. or he's going to go nuts. Um, because you, nope. see, cause you see that a lot with the arms men mm-hmm. on, on those ships. He keeps it together. Um, and he I actually... keeps it together more than the Space Marine does. That's right. like the saddest... The whole thing was just so tragic. Well, I liked... His arc with the Space Marine, he starts mm-hmm. off like, look, I don't venerate them. And then he meets my Zod and he's like, you're cool. Yeah. And then he's like, I really like this guy. And then when he sees what's happened, that moment of, okay, we all have to keep it together. Because he immediately, I love that his, like, he's shocked and terrified. But then his next thought is, I'm surrounded by armed people who just saw this. We need to leave. And everybody needs to be, like, he starts barking orders and just, okay, let's go, let's go, go, go. He, I was, I was so proud of him. And um, I don't know that I would ever forgive Castros for killing him. Ever. I actually thought that Garrick was going to kill him. Oh, God, I thought so. Or, or, I... or that they were going to kill one another. Right. I thought that's, that that's kind of how it's going to That's kind of how it all went. So, you know. <laughs> So let's talk about my Zod for a second, because this poor guy, um, the whole, I loved his character in general. He was, he was very personable. Mm -hmm. He was much more of a human space marine. I like that he was good with small talk. Like he was was there just chatting away and Garrick's like, this guy's like talking to me. It's kind of weird. What's going on here? Yeah. I thought that was great. And it crushed me. As soon as he... So I kind of... Th- this was my one complaint with the book. As soon as that book, that ship came out of subspace and they shot and they killed the ship, I was like, I'll bet you that's an Imperial ship. I'll bet you that's what's going on here. And then when they were describing the traitor Marine, the fact that they kept referring to him as crimson and bronze. Something's not adding up here. I will bet you. And as soon as my Zod starts fighting him, I'm like, oh, this is going to be a loyalist. It crushed me. My Zod just, just, he's been given a task. He's blind. He's made a lot of assumptions. He's half dead. (laughs) He's been given a task. Kill this other Marine. And when they describe him lying on top of the Marine and they're both dying. And he hears the guy say in perfect standard Gothic, Mm -hmm. you blind fool. That was when, so that was my only inkling that something was not right at that point. I was like, wait a minute. And then how Garrick even commented as he pulled my Zod off him. He's like, he didn't have the standard like mutations. He didn't, of course, he didn't recognize the heraldry. Um, But he recognized the language and the script. You know, it just, uh, there's a lot of things in there that 
I don't know. If, I mean, because I don't know every single who knows every single chapter, right? I never heard of the Iron Shades before today. I think, I think it's Chris Rate's homebrew. Okay. Because I had to look them up because I was like, who are these guys from? It's all unknown, and they've only appeared in three books, and they're all Chris Rate books. Okay, so they're 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 his. And that's fine. Um, I, I kind of assumed I kind of assumed that now. When like some random names come in that I've never heard of before, I'm just like, this must be. You like the who now? Oh, okay, that's theirs. That's yeah. I think that's I think that's yours. But I want uh, an Iron Shades book now, though. Please and thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm very fascinated by the Iron Shades. I wonder if they're descendants of the Raven Guard, because they were talking about the the black and have... you know in the this, dark, this, right? And the stealth. I'm like, that yeah. sounds like Horax to me, but. Anyway, um, so no, I didn't really have an inkling that it was an Imperial ship at all. Like, so that all took me by surprise. And like realizing it was not a trader Marine, I was like, okay, but where could this guy have come from? He could have mm -hmm. come from the initial, the initial muster, right? Because they got boarding torpedoes. Who knows? You know, because the assumption was that this guy was from that original muster that had gotten mm -hmm. on board with, with the other the, the bomb that, or not the bomb, but the weapon that, that my Zod, like, sacrificed all of his men for. And, uh, I mean, I just imagined him, like, running with those crack grenades and y screaming YOLO as he jumped on top of it and let him off. And, but, because that was the assumption, right? That that's what that, it was just one of those Marines that was with, with that initial boarding, boarding torpedoes. So where could this guy have come from? Could he have come from the original muster? Could, you know, I didn't even think about the ship being an Imperial ship until, um, honestly, I didn't realize it until Avadi realized it. And then I was like, oh, crap. Oh. Well, and it it also could be because remember, they get, they get hit by those dark Mechanicus and then they talk about how the astropathic choir gets hit. Mm -hmm. So clearly something, I almost think the Mechanicus were a red herring. Because I actually wonder if that device, whatever happened, I was wondering if that device, when it went off, it was meant to take care of the astropaths. It might have been, but remember, they talk about all the fused metal and how something hit that. I and think who knows? maybe, maybe it was a red herring, maybe that's what affected the astropaths. I mean, it's warp shit. Who knows? Literally, who knows? And I liked the idea when they kind of suss out, they're like. The Imperial, the Loyalist Marine must have been put on here. It's like a latch ditch. I got to let them know what's going on. And the entire crew is attacking him. Like the whole thing. Uh, my Zod, my Zod killed me. Cull. Cull made me sad because I wanted to like Cull a lot and her paranoia, her legit paranoia that I think, God, when the warp, like, I like to imagine that when the warp is like, okay, who can I mess with? Who can I mess with? Like, Cole probably was just like a, like, they didn't even need to shove her or work hard on her. Well, they because just had to she be was like, already <laughs> upset about the Inquisition. That they yes. even had a guarded Inquisition ship. And then when the Inquisition came on, came on board their ship, she was already flipping out over, over that mentally. Right. Because she was convinced they were there for her because they don't like to leave loose ends, which I'm like, facts. Um. The fact that she killed Isabel. Yeah. I loved the hospitaler. I loved her whole... I loved her internal... First off, look at that. A sororitas with a personality. What? Yeah, and I she liked had a personality. She... She's like, I like my food. I like to drink. It's like, well, you're not a normal normal sister. And as she told Kiastros, she was just like, oh, people... Women of my order can be so insufferable. <laughs> I snickered I that. loved that. I like wrote that one down because I loved that so much. And I like later when she's thinking about it and she's like, I like to laugh. Like these people that I'm helping, she's like, I'm doing the actual emperor's work here because I'm helping. And these people laugh. These people experience joy. Like I did like mm -hmm. the when uh, she was just like, well, I should be able to carry a blade because the hospitalers are, you know, they're not real daughters of the emperor. And, well, you know, that's why we have the uh, Repentia legions for thought thinking like that and she's like okay like i guess we'll i guess we'll be a hospitaler and it actually ended up working out really well for her well i mean if that's your that's your choice right up until that point hospitaler <laughs> repentia i mean get give me a scalpel yeah. call me nurse 
Um, yeah, I thought she, I thought she was a great character, and Cull killing her just killed me. But that, that scene in general, when they break into the astropathic choir, that was horrific. Yeah, poor Artuyo. Like, you knew he was dead. We pretty much assumed, yeah. as soon as they were like, we can't get hold of Fortuyo. I'm like, oh, it's because he's dead, friends. And just even um, when Santelena was like, I, you know, she was hearing him saying the pain, the pain. I was like, he's in, he's trapped in the warp. That's w- what what it is, most likely what you're hearing. But I wasn't e- expecting that. But I have to say, you know, if you really want to fuck with people, you mess up their astropaths. It works every time. Exactly. <laughs> Nine out of ten times, it works every time. Um, they, that whole concept. And then you understand why the Imperium is so eager to, like, we have to kill this thing. We have to either have to kill the ship or we have to cut off the astropathic choir because neither of these are good things. Um, I cannot imagine the havoc they were playing with the other ships in the area. And the whole... D- <laughs> I think everybody in here probably knows that I have a thing with like mouths being too big. Um, when they described what he looked like. <laughs> I knew that it was going to be bad when she got up there. I didn't think it was going to be quite like that. <laughs> I have to say, I was not expecting that. Um, you didn't expect just, it to be like a fabulous bill workshop? More or less, yeah. Yeah, um. Gives new meaning to talking heads. Um, it's not good. It's not good. Uh, I felt really bad for him, though. And Cull, yeah, Cull, Isabel. I was happy that Isabel kept it together, though. Like, she was fully... Like, she got there. She's like, oh, I... Okay, this makes sense. We cut this out. Everything's going to be fine. And then Cull, and Cull... had to come up there, too. You can't kill him. Because I won't go back with the Inquisition. Oh my god. Honey. That would be a better fate than this. Just kill yourself for god's sake. Um, speaking well, of the Apparently she became one with the engines. Whatever that means. So it's not going to be good. They're all dead. They're all dead. Right. right. Exactly. Speaking of the Inquisition. I have a lot of mixed feelings on this. Fuck um, oh, that's That's fair. Hmm. Were they a good addition to the story? Well, I have I mean, feelings on this. Considering that's the only link to how this is a Dawn of Fire book, I mean, they kind of have to be, but in a way, at the same time, <laughs> I kind of found it very interesting that, of course, it's the Inquisition makes everything worse. Right? First they break formation. Their ship breaks out of formation. And then they won't answer any hails. Right. And Castro's like, what What are you doing? We're here to protect you. Oh, crap. Everyone's dead. And then, oh, no, we got, we, you know, we, we, have, we have a runner. Well, we got to protect them because we said that. And as soon as that interrogator gets on the ship, first of all, he's not even an inqu- inquisitor. He's a freaking interrogator. He means, he immediately is king jackass he's just like i need your astropathic choir you must do this you must do that well we don't think we even have astropathic choir well you have to get that fixed yeah okay we're kind of having problems here and he's like but that's not my problem I'm like uh yeah kind of his friend it kind <laughs> of is friend well uh, i did like he was, he i did was like so frustrating he was so frustrating but avadi pegs him mm-hmm. immediately she's like he claims he's an authority but he doesn't feel it. There's some nervousness there. Like she basically pegs him immediately. And that's not a good combination, right? It is not because he, when he says like my, my interrogator is dead. So I'm basically in charge here now, or my inquisitor's dead. I'm basically in charge. Totally true. Yes. But you can tell he's chafing and he doesn't really know what to do with it. So a person unsure of their authority, wielding absolute authority that's a bad combination, friends. Uh, he was just throwing it around. Nothing good. Oh, and he he was, and it was, it was blatant and unsubtle. Yeah, it was to the point. It's like, do you understand how we are stranded in the middle of space right now? 
You can threaten us all you want, and it's not going to change the fact that we can't go anywhere. We have no astropathic choir, my guy. Yeah. Like, I understand that you need it, but <laughs> spoiler alert. So do we. Yeah, because like, we don't even, because our together. Augers, all our augers are down. We are literally blind. We have no idea where we are. So. And I think, I think it shows how removed the Inquisition is from everyday life and everyday struggles. Yeah, so like, absolutely. When he's, when he's like, our astropathic choir, we can't reach them. To reach them. All of our augers are down. So fix them. Like, throw oh. one of your 60,000 people at it. and oh, We hadn't thought of that. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. You mean we could just fix this stuff? What? Like, it, it was so, it was so condescending. And you could just tell again that that's how removed he is from everyday struggle and people just... So go fix it. Yeah. I told you, you to do something and you're still here. This. Why are you still here? Exactly. And don't you dare question us because what we, and no, okay. To be fair, what you have is very serious and you cannot let that fall into the hands of the enemy. But by being a complete and total douche canoe. All you're doing is making people wonder what you have. And you don't have to tell people. You don't have to be like, well, this is a shard of Erebus. And what Actually, this means I don't think is, he knew what it was. I don't think he does either. All he had to do was explain, look, we need to get this. This is super dangerous. Oh, and the enemy is coming for it. Can we please vamoose? Like, let's figure out how to get out of here. But no, what he says instead is, go fix your ship and stop asking me questions. Like, you watched the Inquisitor, but I, I feel like, especially his parents, do you ever like know parents who are kind of badass people like they're really funny and they're but they're like really straight i'm thinking of one child that i know in particular her mom is just like this badass i just kind of tell you what i'm thinking and nobody ever wonders but she knows when to apply it her daughter doesn't her daughter's kind of a dick because she just bleh, right mm. like i just act like my mom does but she doesn't understand that her mom knows the time and place um she, she like the interrogator the finesse the finesse <laughs> um, I feel like the, this interrogator was that. He probably grew up, you know, he served this inquisitor who probably threw her weight around the room, but probably had a better handle of when and where to do it. I'm sure that if the captain would have been dealing with Gertrude, she would have been like, okay, so what do we do about these problems that we have? Rather than, so go fix it and get out of my face. She would have had some of her people even go help. I'm making a big assumption there. And um, are we all agreed that, like, the way that he described the Inquisitor retinue, I was like, are these Tenebris's people? Or are they the, oh, shoot, what's the word from um, Hellraiser? The Cenobites? Are these the Cenobites from Hellraiser? If you've seen Hellraiser, too, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Don't lie to me. Um, is that what we're talking about here? They don't sound right. But then I was like, oh, it is an Inquisitor retinue, so... Who knows? I mean, at least you have I a savant. Don't... I did have a savant. Yes. Who was also kind of an arrogant. I just thought, I think most savants did plug are. The, but I just did plug the thing into his neck. You know, when she's like, hey, there's this language that I don't understand. He's like, well, that's our personal language. You're not supposed to know. Calm down. Okay. You just want to know what they said was very relevant. Right. <laughs> Did it ever occur to you that maybe, step it out on a limb here, what they were saying, and here's the thing about that that infuriated me so much. I understand. I understand completely. I was so mad when he was like, turn off all hails from this ship because we don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear it. And like, they couldn't, they weren't really in range to hear what the, the, um, the oh, transport right. was saying but i understood when he was like no turn off all hails turn them all off because yeah. how many times in books have we seen that when what? a ship hails and they throw over yep madness just yes. ma literal madness i mean when how many said, times have we seen that when he said that i was like seems legit yeah i was already starting to be like mm, i don't know about this and but then again it's like I get it. We have seen that in so many books. It would be one thing if he trotted that out and we were like, that's never happened. 
That happens all the time. And to be fair, the Imperial ship didn't help themselves any. No. By no, I understand they were thinking they were helping by firing at the spire, but really the best thing they could have done was to not shoot back. <laughs> like, just put all their shields up a, a, against the runner, and eventually they're noticing why aren't they firing back? Maybe they might answer some hails. Maybe then they can get a clearer look at the ship, see its livery, you know, all of that. But so yeah, it was a lot of. A lot of strong heads of you must listen to me now without doing a lot of listening themselves. Right. Listening, but not hearing or hearing, but not listening, whichever. Listening, but not hearing, I think is what I'm looking for. Yeah, they, a lot of that. A lot of that indeed. And also, again, a lot of that privatization of information or that, um, that compartmentalization of information, right? Like I actually, one of my favorite scenes is when Garrick, when they're going down through the um, the lower levels and he finally is like, none of this makes sense. And I think it's her. She's just like, oh my God, I thought it was just me. Could y'all communicate a little bit, please? And then same thing when Isabel is like, Isabel says the same thing. She's like, None of this makes sense. We're both too high and too low simultaneously. And Cull is like, oh my God, yes, I'm having the same problem with my instruments. Like, it's but all this it's, just... Uh, I think it's also different when a sister says it, right? Because they're supposed to be like so holy. So if they say it, then there's definitely right. something not right. Versus if I say it to the master of armsmen, is he going to think that I'm touched somehow? Touched. Oh. Yeah, exactly. No, it's it's the exact right word for it. And the answer is yes. So when the master armsman says that, um, everyone all of a sudden goes, okay, all right, we're safe. Yeah, yeah, for us too. That taps into a concept that I love, by the way. Um, a book called House of Leaves did that really well. Half of the book is really good. The other half really sucks. But the half when they describe the house, that's bigger on the inside. I love that as a device. And like when uh, Avadi is trying to go to see the navigator and she's like some, some passages would just dead end or doors wouldn't open right. or life support would suddenly go out. Uh, but she was kind of communicating some of that stuff. I didn't like that Kiastros kept sending her to deal with the Inquisition until he finally, I mean, to be fair, better her than him in the end. I guess. I mean, I don't know if anything would have been different if he dealt with the Inquisition versus her. Probably not. They were so pig-headed. I, I think you're probably right, but I'd like to think otherwise. All right. Uh, I, I, I think at least half of the problems of this whole thing was because of the Inquisition. One, for how their ship originally behaved. Two, how they behave on, on on the ship itself. Three, how they wouldn't even talk. Right. When, when Castro is coming down, he's like, "We're going to take it." They won't even talk. All that they're saying, all they're doing, is yelling at him that he doesn't know what he's talking about. Friend, has that worked this entire time you've been here? I know you're in the Inquisition and you know all whatever, but constantly telling somebody that, that they don't know what they're talking about when they're clearly stark raving mad <laughs> does not help. No, no, not at all. Um, he was not well equipped for that conversation, was he? No, but he was right, trying to have... hide behind his authority, not realizing that he was totally outgunned. Didn't even Correct. think of it. I mean, how many <laughs> thousands of tens of thousands of people are on the ship, right? That's the arrogance of the Inquisition, though, right? right. <laughs> You're not going to attack me. I'm the Inquisition. What you don't, you don't seem to understand the situation here, do you? Like, again, and I am inferring so much because we don't know Gertrude, but I'm making some assumptions here. Um, I feel like a seasoned inquisitor would have recognized the situation and been like, everybody take a breather. Let's, let's, let's consider what we're doing here. But instead he pulls out the Cartman, you will respect my authority. And maybe she was just as much of a dick. 100%. Could have been. I don't know. We'd have to have I mean, Chris Ray, Ray in on. I mean, like, to be fair. I made that character to be an asshole, too. Her, oh, her okay. ship 
It was her ship that started, broke formation. So that could have right. been under her orders. She clearly knows Rostov, though, since Ilmatos or Ilmoros specifically mentions Rostov, which it's another tie in with the Donna fire, which we need to talk oh, about. Oh, yeah, that that's one. Inquisitor MacGuffin. Yeah, we need to talk about Donna fire now. Uh, who, uh, who has that Xenos in his retinue? Yeah, the ape like thing. And he's of the order of Xenos and doesn't make any sense. We have to talk about Donna Fire. We keep putting it off. We have to. I'm sorry. How does this fit in with the rest of Donna Fire? And was it. Okay, so I will to say right off the bat, but I thought that the Inquisition had was the Ring of Bucharest. Same. That was discussed in book one. Because he kept two. talking about how tiny it was. Right. Right. Especially said he just put his hand around it. Makes sense. Books one, two, and four all talk about the Ring of Bucharest. Yes. And um, so I was like, this has got to be what it is. Now we get to see what this thing is. And it's like, no, it was this stone thing. It was like a sword. I'm like, okay. I did find it very fascinating that when Garrick sees him, he's like, the sword is wielding him. It's like, well, that's some warp fuckery right there. Oh, yeah. And then you find out this is all done by Tenebrus to get the last shard of Erebus. It's like, okay. So now that we have all the shards of Erebus, are we going to reforge the original... Um, Anything? Mm -hmm. He said he did. Or he's going to. And that's what we're going to use to try to kill the Emperor? I guess. Or is it just going to wake him up? Or Robbie Bobby. One of the two. You guys, I know we've railed about this before. Whatever the book was, was it book three? Or was it five? Where they first introduced the Shards of Erebus? I remember you and uh, I vividly five. remember you and I. I remember vividly remember you and I having a conversation about. So we have the room of ring of Bucharest, and now we have the shards of Erebus. Have we just ditched the ring? Has the one ring of power just? Have we just decided that that was kind of lame? So we're going to go with the shards of Erebus because we're we're not sticking to one cohesive story in this cohesive story. Um, I really don't like that there's two MacGuffins out there right now: this ring and the shards of Erebus to make the anathem. Which, sure, whatever you guys. I find I, that I, interesting I really, considering I that. I mean. So the anathame was only used once, and that was against Horus. So then Erebus got to use, like, his, you know, he got to take some peyote, right, and go fix him. Fix right. him. I'm doing air quotes for our podcast people. He fixed him. And um, then he broke it up into nine pieces, because that's just what we do. And made other little athames, gave them out to people. Party favors. I know that a couple of um, uh, perpetuals got a hold of them. I think all person took one and went somewhere back in time. I don't know. You know what? Doesn't matter. It's the magical MacGuffin that makes some of the perpetuals be able to be the Forest Gump of the Her Horus Heresy. Is there an important event? A perpetual is there thanks to their knives. So. I'm not sure where we got all of them since the some of the pet I know at least two perpetuals have have a couple. So I think they're killed. I think, but doesn't matter. If the end and the death doesn't end with every single <laughs> perpetual dying. But all well, last I saw all person, he was like in another time. He's like, oh crap! I don't know how I even got here. <laughs> Whoopsie! That, yeah, not that that matters or anything, but I guess it doesn't matter. How the Athames all got together. They brought them all together, and I guess now they're going to present it to Abaddon. Or they're going to use it to summon Erebus. Because I could see Erebus being like, that's mine. <laughs> I stole it first. And what's he going to do? Show up and be the worst character of the 40k universe? He's going to show up and be like, that's my sword. And Abaddon's going to be like, <laughs> friend. No. I just, I think that's the thing is I don't understand where that's driving towards. I understand, like, are they going to go try and kill Robbie Bobby? Are they going to go try and kill the Emperor? I don't care. Do you want to know why? You want to talk about plot armor. You are not killing a Primarch in this crappy series. 
You are not killing or revitalizing the Emperor in this crappy series. We right. all know it. My dog knows it. Your dog would know because his name is Rogaldor. He knows. It's true. My cat, Caiaphas Kane, also knows. It... I, I just, I don't understand to what end. Like, oh, we're going to introduce this super cool MacGuffin weapon. Okay. One of the reasons that I really hated the Wheel of Time series was it's either in the second or the third book. They get this magical horn. The horn that will summon all of the yes. heroes of old to fight yep. their fight That for was, them. I think, book three, because I think it was the last book I read in full. Right. So I stopped reading, I think, book five. But what infuriated me was that they get this horn that summons all of the magical heroes of yore to come and fight your fine, hardest battles. Kind of like they the get horn it. of Gondor. But we didn't copy that. Yeah, pretty that. much. Did, but we didn't copy that. Nuh-uh. Nuh-uh. <laughs> it's original. It has a different name and a different shape. It's a bugle. Whereas the horn of Gondor is like a, like a, you know, like a whole, like an ancient antler horn. Anyways. So they use the bugle of magic to summon all of the heroes of old, kind of like that one scene in um, Return of the King. And they promptly just not use it ever again. That's the problem with magical MacGuffins, is that once you introduce the super weapon, you now have to deal with that and acknowledge that it's out there and find reasons for them to not use it great you've reforged this mystical magical blade of erebus so i'm going to try to say that he's going to use it to cut a hole directly into the emperor's throne room and kill him yeah at, at what point what like you again i refuse to believe that in this series this series is going to end with them cutting a magic hole into the emperor's throne room but wait They've been thwarted by some stupid nonsense. And then we're just never going to talk about the blade again. Like, you can't. Like, this is the type of world-moving stuff. Or does stuff. Robbie Bobby break it with his sword of fire? That'd be badass. Um, however, having said that, that's why you can't introduce this kind of stuff. Because, again, in this series, you're... We're just going to have it just in case. Just in case. Just just it's just hanging out there in case you realize that you could use it to cut through time and space and go anywhere you wanted, right? Yeah, but not yet. Or we're waiting for the time to be right. Why? Or, or is Tenebris going to use this to overthrow Abaddon? God, I hope not, because I. Well, guys, I mean, it's I not going to work. I don't like that character. It, okay, this is one small complaint that I have. I don't like Young, but Young was clearly described in all the books as having all these chains like hanging off of her. And in this book, they describe her as having all these gemstones on her. And if you recall, one of the Inquisitor's retinue had gemstone eyes. Mm -hmm. I just found that really weird. Maybe it is coincidental. I don't know. Oh, that's right. I found that a little weird. And again, I'm like, she has chains all over her. Has she upgraded? <laughs> She's she like, the chains, the chains are gauche. Sapphires are very, very in. I just actually um, imagine the gems just hanging all over the chains, like little charms. She has just little charm bracelets all over her. Do you remember when the, the belly chain was in? Oh, God. Yes. That's what she I just, kind of imagine. A bunch of every belly time, with the charms. Every time she shows up, Genie in a Bottle plays. <laughs> um, because Christina Aguilera really liked those belly chains, you see. Um. I will say right now, this was the best entry into the Donna Fire series, but I don't, I really don't think it really fit in well. Tonally, it didn't really fit well either. And it, look, I really enjoyed it because it was a great horror novel, but mm -hmm. this is not like anything we've seen in the Donna Fire series. We went from like swashbuckling to political drama to horror novel. Okay. Like, this whole, I know that we keep railing against the series. Yes, this was the best entry. There were lots of scenes in here that I'm telling you right now for the book club awards. I know it's early to say it, but the scene when they break into the astropathic choir, I already feel like that's a contender um, because it's so well written and so wonderfully done. But, and what happens next? Like, where does this 
fit in the grand scheme of things. Are you even invested in this wherever it's going? I don't, you know, I haven't cared for a, since Iron Kingdom. I, I think I didn't care before Iron Kingdom. Like, I feel like every book was the book that I was like, okay, I think this one's going to be better. Well, because the no. first one was okay. Gated Bones was good. I know, but Gated Bones, we were like, okay, okay. And then the third book, but uh, no. I, I like that one. You did not. And the fourth one was like, okay, it's okay. And then Iron Kingdom happened. We're like, what? <laughs> I don't even remember the name of the sixth I... book. I don't. Wasn't that? Oh, that's um, that's the Martyr's Tomb. Okay. With Astrid. Right. And the, the rogue trader who comes back to life. Yes. Which is complete and total heresy, my friends. Um, I had a real problem with that one. Uh, and then there was, what, Throne of Light? And Throne of Light was the one where I remember not starting to be like, no. Yeah, that, just was, no. that, that was the fourth book where I was like, okay, we're kind of getting back to the Bucharest's ring and things are kind of, you know, solidifying again. But it's kind of boring at the same time. Yeah, so I don't you know even... What? I have no idea because the next book's the last book. So I have no idea how this is going to end. Okay, you've got the, the magical MacGuffin. And I think you have the Ring was. of Bucharest. Yeah, like, what is the point of this? I actually, okay. I'm assuming you read the introduction. I skimmed it. I was sympathetic to Chris Raitt's concept. I think he was right. I think he actually t tapped into something very important when he said, he's like, look... I wanted to focus on something micro, one ship, one mission. And I actually think that was the right thing to do because you and I have talked about this a little too much or about a lot that they've diversified a little too much. It's a little too big in scope, too many things going on, too many people mm -hmm. moving, too many stuff, Just stuff, too much stuff. Um, okay. All right, that's fair. Yeah. Um. So I, I was sympathetic to his aim, but yeah, I, I mean, we get to the end of this book, and I'm like, okay, great. So the the sword gets reforged in this. Okay. Now, now, how are they going to wrap this all up? We have this damn ring out there. We have this sword. So we have the Primaris. We have this rogue trader. We have the the Primaris Marines. Like it needed. So like, do you know what this? Even do you know what the series needed, Carrie. So the Horus Heresy meandered a lot. Right? Oh, but so much. you can say it was cohesive. It fell in line. They all connected to the underlying thing of the Horus Heresy. I haven't read Siege of Terra, but I have a feeling it's kind of the same way. Yes, they're all kind of out there, but at the same time, it's still following along a certain timeline. This, I felt like it had a purpose in the first two books. It had a clear-cut purpose. The third one did this weird deviation. Fourth one brought it back. And then it was like, well, actually, you know what? Instead of talking about this grand things, I thought this was going to be about like the initial campaigns of the Age of Indominus. I thought that was the whole point of this was the initial campaigns. Because, right. because um, Dark Imperium kind of glossed over that, right? Kind of skipped ahead mm -hmm. 100 years. And then they retconned that regardless. Right. I thought this was going to be like a cohesive thing of what was going on. And then I feel like then they went to, to, to the Iron Kingdom. Well, you know, we need the Knights for, you know, to get the Knights Alliance here. But, but why? This doesn't have anything to do with what you've already established in the first few books. And then to bring Martyr's Tomb in, to have it connect to another rogue trader book that we read outside of the Dawn of Fire series just seemed weird. So I'm going to actually, I want everyone to know this pains me inside. I was thinking a lot about this. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give the wolf time a little bit of credit. Avenging Sun, the first Dawn of Fire book, number one, planted a lot of seeds, right? Like a lot of here's a bunch of different ways we could go with the series. Here's all the stuff that's going on. We've got this weird Primus guy, and this Belisarius calls doing stuff, and no one really quite knows what's going on there. Bob's got his hands full. The Primaris are new people don't like new there's all this political stuff going on right so you have that book over here you have one you have book two over here which book two is like 
Ring of Bucharest. Here's all this stuff going on. Here's what the overarching theme of this is going to be. We've got custodians moving. Uh, Tenebris is introduced. We have all of this stuff with uh, chaos. They're trying to move towards making this big weapon and trying to get stuff. And okay, great. Three actually ties into one with the concept of this is how people are dealing with the Primaris. This is how this is being. And this is one very small example of how people are reacting to this. And this is how the Primaris are trying to. Okay. And if you so think those of, two books, honestly, the first... any founding chapter that's going to have the biggest problem with this, it's going to be the Space Wolves. Very much so. So, okay. So you have one and three that tie very directly to one another. And then two was out kind of here on an outlier. Well, then four comes in and four is like, okay, I'm going to tie into two. It's almost like the Star Trek movies. The even numbered ones are good. The, bo the bad, the odd number ones we just don't talk about. Um, so two and four really directly tie into each other. <laughs> okay. All right. And then five is about the Iron Kingdom. And you're like, okay. so this, okay, maybe this one kind of ties into one and three because you're trying to show all of the politics that Bob is dealing with, it directly tied into number two because that's where this charming woman's daughter was killed. And so it kind of ties into that, but also it was like, here's the politics that Bob is dealing with and here's all this kind of stuff. And look at what, look at the stuff he's having to deal with. He's got these petty ass people doing petty ass things. And then six is just like, hey, rogue traders, the tie into this one rogue trader novel. And, uh. and then this book, horror novel, everyone. Horror, which kind of ties into books two and four, but a little bit into five and the shards of Erebus. And it's really tenuous at best. Um, How they, I could not think of that word for a second there, you guys. I wanted to just say tenebrous. I'm like, nope, 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 <laughs> you know, tenuous. Um, it's, it's real close. Um, That was embarrassing. Um, But I at least owned up to it um it the, the series needed a project manager it needed a plan and it needed something like i would actually be okay if they were like okay books one three and five are all dealing with this theme books two four and six are all dealing with this it just didn't happen and now they're like let's just Number eight, let's just take it outside and give it the old yellow treatment. I know that we said that after Iron Kingdom and we damn sure said it after Sea of Souls, but like, or uh, the Martyr's, Martyr's Tomb. Tomb. But now, now at this one, like, okay, Chris Rate, here's the thing I'm going to say. Chris Rate couldn't get this train back on the rails. So honestly, after book four. Yeah, Throne I, of Light, which was. was so. Fucking I really think that five, six, and now seven could have been standalone mm -hmm. books. Yeah, I would agree with that. You so know what? One, two, have, three, four. I might have liked them. I might have liked um, them a little more if they were standalone. Maybe, maybe not. But just because the fact that I was reading them, I'm trying to tie them into the first half of the series. I was like, I don't understand what's going on here. You know, my initial reaction when you said that was no, but now that I've taken a breath and I'm thinking about it, um, I just may not have been as harsh on them, put it that way. You know what? I think had book six, had Martyr's Tomb been a direct sequel to, um, Void King. I can't remember the name. Void King. Had it just been the direct sequel, kind of like, do you remember, um, uh, no, Void King was the, the Necron books, wasn't it? No. Ruin. No, that, and... that, that was Twice Dead King. Twice Dead King. Sorry. There's too many kings. Anyways, remember that, those books were fast follow sequels. I think had they done that with the Martyrs Tomb, I think you're 100% right. We wouldn't have loved it. But it would have been an interesting sort of sequel, right? right? The Iron Kingdom as a standalone book, I think we would not have enjoyed it still, but we would have at least understood it a little bit better. And she didn't have to have died in Gate of Bones, right? Her daughter just could have died in some other conflict. I exactly. actually think, actually, now that I'm talking about this out loud, I think you're 100% correct. I think had it not tied into Gate of Bones so that we didn't know how chaotic and terrible it was that she was like, didn't even take care of her body. 
honey, do you know how many people's children are dead on that planet right now? Um, I think if she just died in an engagement, we would have been like, oh, that's a real bummer. Right? Um, I think you're absolutely right. And this is a horror novel, I think would have been outstanding. Mm -hmm. Do we even know who's writing the eighth book? I don't think so. I don't think what it's going to be about? No, I don't think there's been a single announcement. But I bet it, considering how much they, how they, but they cranked out like three last year or something like that. Yeah. I think so. Surely the eighth one's coming out this year. Surely. I mean, they actually cranked out, they're cranking out the third volume of The End and the Death faster than I thought they would. Right. And they haven't announced the fourth one in that yet. And then they did you know, say it was the third and final for now. I'm waiting for just kidding. There's a fourth one coming because there's more stuff for us to talk about with John Grammaticus. Um, not bitter. You're bitter. God, stop projecting. Um, and the other question is who will possibly write it? Because they have Gee Haley's written two, Gav Thorpe wrote one, Andy Clark wrote one, Nick Keim. Chris Rate, Mark Collins, are they going to have Andy Clark finish it out? Maybe he can like bring it all together with the Shards of Erebus and the Ring of Bucharest and bring it on home. You guys, he's somebody, the eighth oh, book. Oh, God, no. You know who's going to write it? John French. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Jen, for those listening, Jen is processing, processing, processing. Um, the spinning beach ball <laughs> is on my face right now. Um, Guys, she will not. totally murder me if it really is John French. I don't even know what I will do. Then all hope is lost. You know what? I might actually dig my heels on that one and say no. So we're going to read it. We're going to finish it. What, if, what if he does write it and he ties it into the Ariman series? If Araman shows up in this, you know what though? At this point, why not? We have a character from the Age of Apostasy that basically everyone's forgotten about, right? With his, his magical ring of power. Great. Erebus. Everyone loves Erebus. Um, this this tenebrous guy, which ever since he cut the tentacle off and ate it, I'm like, you know what? Hard pass on him. Um, he just really likes sushi. <laughs> With you, what is wrong with you fundamentally? Um, I, I just, I just can't. I don't think I can. Um, I do not trust. I might trust Andy Clark to maybe. Look, I don't think the eighth book is going to wrap it all up with a bow. I think it's going to be kind of slapdash, has haphazard, and it's going to be gonna like lead um, right into Dark Imperium. It's going to be like really terrible gorp. Um. Where people were just like, yeah, throw the Chex mix in with the Skittles. Who cares? Um, that's what we're going to end up with. Cheez-Its and Skittles in one bowl. I think, I think the video game version of that was Daikatana. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> there's, there's a good reference. <laughs> Let us know if you remember that game. Um, or the game. I cannot think of the name of it right now, but Jim and I reference it all the time. <laughs> Where the guys, it was a terrible game. It was fundamentally broken. Uh, with the guy with his body parts came off. We're like, rolling, rolling, rolling. And had like five <laughs> lines of dialogue. <laughs> oh my God, I don't know what that is. Oh, our friend Kyle and I just, mm, mm. not a fan of that one. Oh, it was so bad. And it had a Megadeth as the soundtrack. I think it came out like the same year as Die Katana. But yes, exactly. It's going <laughs> to Die Katana, the this soundtrack. series. Oh God. Wow. Yeah. Um. It's going to die Katana. That's what it's going to be. Or it's just going to be horrendously bad. And they're just going to go a whole other way entirely. Like, what What shards of Erebus? Now that that magical MacGuffin's out there, we literally never have to talk about it again. Ever. Yay! Um, or worse, Dan Abnett writes the last one. And it's in three parts. 8a 8b and 8c <laughs> um i just i don't want any no no he'll do the number like final fantasy 13 <laughs> book 8 book 8x book 8x2 book 8x2 overdrive hyper remix i um well that's capcom 
That's what? a Capcom game. <laughs> Super Remix <laughs> Ultra Alpha Book Eight Revengeance <laughs> <laughs> Rules of Nature. Um, my daughter still listens to that song to get ready for hockey games. Um, and I think of Raiden every time I hear it. Um, yeah, I I just I really love Chris Wright. I think he gave this the best college try that he could. And it was a, he wrote a good book, but he could not put the Donna Fire series back on rails for me. I uh, still I mean, like, so I got Meh. to a certain point in the book. I think it was like the last 150 pages. I was up all night finishing it. Like, I, I can't stop now. I have to see where this mm-hmm. goes. So Same. and then the epilogue happened and I was like, I, OK, Guess could we never speak of this now. again ever? Uh, Again, like the end of Gate of Bones would have been so great if not for the end. Rostov's not in here and I don't even like him. I mean, I understand he had to connect this somehow because... Yes. I mean, Martyr's Tomb didn't even try to connect. Let's be real. Neither did Iron Kingdom, really. Other than the My Daughter Died in Gate of Bones. Yes, I mean, that's how it connected. Gathalamor, like the only planet I can remember really off the top of my head. I I don't know. All I know is that given the publishing schedule, given that nothing really new has come out, we've read like everything as soon as it came out. Um, we have decided to we have to dig into the Wayback Machine. Um, so we're gonna read some ADB, some classic ADB, no less. And I'm actually kind of excited about it because I think I need to take a step back, y'all, from Donna Fire or anything like that. That and she's been hustling um, me to read this for a while, so I have we're into reading the Night Lords trilogy. We are my thirteen year old copy here. Um so funny story, our really good friend Drew, shout out to Drew, was reading these books and he started asking me questions. He was like, Hey, did you like this scene? And I was like, That was was that in book two or one or three or I don't really remember that scene because I read these book, this book 13 years ago so I'm actually really excited to refresh myself with it um it's different we haven't done a chaos space marine book in a while let's see if Carrie absolutely uh, hates this one since Angron I think yeah 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 I think you're right I had to think about that I think you're absolutely right um so this will be a good one uh and if Carrie doesn't like this one we'll probably pass on the second or third one but the lord of night won the um like reader's choice so i think they're going to republish that so this will be a good lead-in for lord of night which is a classic that i've always wanted to read and just never quite gotten around to it more night lords um i will (laughs) i will be reading the omnibus because um i'm worried that my copy will fall apart if i crack it open (laughs) and i bought this book i might as well read it (laughs) Damn it. So, um, yeah, Night Lords on the Sea of, on the heels of Sea of Souls. We're just going from one soul to the next, from the Sea of Souls to Soul Hunter. Exactly. This one had lots of souls. This one just one, one single soul. Just one? Do you think, Jerry? It just is a soul hunter. It doesn't mean he only hunts one soul. It does. Oh. That's what his name is. He hunts oh. one very specific soul. Okay, and then I, apparently I'll understand or be horrified by Jen's little hashtag of Team Sorrel. Find that out. Should be, should be fun. Although she may hate me if I don't like these books. We'll see. Sorrel is the literal best. <laughs> Fight me. Yeah, watch me hate this character now. You're not going to like him. <laughs> oh, great. This is going to be fun. Hopefully you'll love to not like him, though. Oh, that's always fun, too. Like Arian from the Fabulous Bill series. Mm. Love that character, but he's not a good person. No, he's not a good guy. But he was a fun character. Exactly. So hopefully, hopefully, this is going to be a really rough podcast, you guys. I'm going to be sitting there the whole time like, love my psycho murderers. Well, we'll see. Because I don't like Conrad Kurz. He kind of freaks me out. But, well, we'll see. Yeah. 
So anyway, so you have listened to the Warhammer 40K book club episode regarding Sea of Souls by Chris Rate. Be sure to join us next time for Soul Hunter by Aaron Dembski Bowden. And no, we actually do not have the uh, collector's editions. This is actually a book that I only bought one copy of. <laughs> I really did want them, but I couldn't but justify. I think the price they're also super expensive as well. Yeah, they were. Yeah. So, but we are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the Vedcast and Podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those wonderful things to the Vidcast on YouTube or the podcast anywhere you get podcasts. Our site also has articles about our adventures and reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside the book club books. So I have started again the Horus Heresy. Ten books to go. Surely I can get that done this year. And then I can start on Siege of Terra and then hate myself all over again. Good times had by all. So please stay a while and read from a crack. And yeah, I'm still all furious. Ave Dominus Knox. Well, that's suitable for next book. Told you I love my psycho murderers. Yeah, I'm going to be like reassessing our friendship after this, aren't I? I'd be like, oh my God, if she likes these people, I don't know if I can like trust her with anything. <laughs> Just play the talking head, psycho killer. Just play that in the background the whole time and you'll feel a lot better about it. That sexy bass lick, will be fine. I might be reassessing some things now. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.